بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. Just uh, one uh, sort of uh, ask a, a supplementary really. Um, they, you know, Sayyid said that the liquid was given to the Prophet. The, uh, the people who gave the liquid, they claimed Umar Mumineen claimed that it was a medicine and uh, the Prophet had forbidden that he didn't want any medicine then they said that he's uh, suffering from some condition the Prophet says the Prophets don't suffer from those conditions and then they accused uh, his uncle and uh, the boss for administering uh, is it uh, was the medicine then the prophet uh, asked that that medicine be given to all was Hazrat Abbas included amongst those who received that medicine and the second is would uh, the prophet uh, having completed his mission completed his deed informed the ummah that he's completed his deed nominated his successor and Allah has given him the information that he, he wants him to meet him would then the angels necessarily have stopped his martyrdom, which is a rutba in itself. Thank you, Sayyid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think the brother um, will really explain the tradition that's there. As I said, there was an aim to force this medicine in, and he had made it clear that he doesn't want to take it, and they had forced it into him, and he sees marks of the medicine near his mouth. Uh, you know, it raises question marks about the behavior that has happened on that day. Um, in terms of his, go his going back towards his Lord, yes, without a doubt, it was his final year. And as we know, every soul shall taste death. In which way the souls taste death, Allah only decides. So mm -hmm. it's not for an angel to come and interfere on what Allah has written. And um, so back to the questions of tonight. Uh, another accusation now moving forward is that the Shias believe in a different Quran and that we don't uh, value or respect the Quran uh, that all Muslims uh, read today. How would we do, uh, answer that misconception? This is one of the oldest misconceptions, unfortunately, and it's one um, where if you go to uh, some of the scholars of certain mosques of other schools in Islam, which have a hatred towards the Shia, the first thing they'll say is, be careful, they believe in a different Quran. You say, what do we mean? Uh, what do you mean that we believe in a different Quran? And the reply will be that you have a surah in your Quran which is called Surat al-Wilaya mm. and that has Ali's name in it and apparently you believe that Ali is mentioned and so on and we always say if you say we have a different Quran then come to our mosques and show us the different Quran to the extent one person once took his friend to one of the mosques where there was a Shia majority of course the mosque is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it was a mosque of a Shia majority and he took his friends he said you know you said we have a different Quran he said yeah he said, go and find, where's the, that Quran printed in you see in the corner? He went and opened it and said, printed on behalf of the king of Saudi Arabia and the servant of the uh, two holy uh, mosques. So you find that uh, when we look at this issue, the Qurans that we have are the Qurans every other Muslim has. Someone says that, you know, you believe that the Quran has been changed and so on. First and foremost, our scholars state that whatever is between those two covers, is what came down to Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If we believe there are verses missing, then we can't form a legal system. Mm. You see, how am I meant to form a legal system and say to you, this is haram or this is halal? But then you could reply to me and say, but how do I know there was a verse which abrogated that issue? You need the Quran to form a legal system for your school. Mm. And on the second level, if there are certain books which were written in history, which say, which narrate traditions, which seem confusing. For example, someone may narrate a tradition of a particular Shiite scholar, a Shiite scholar who came forward and said that there are this many verses in the Quran, like 16,000 verses. Mm -hmm. So someone said, look, you have a different Quran. There's only six and a half thousand verses in the Quran. You say 16,000. 
We reply by saying, yes, if you take the Qur'an and the commentary of the Qur'an, you add them together, it could come to 16,000. Mm. So our scholars are unanimous in coming forward and saying that what's between the covers is what we follow and is the basis of our law. Thank you very much. We have another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Salam, brother. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, brother. Um, wa alaikum. Um, my question is uh, basically there's a misconception about um, Ummah Kalsum alayhi salam uh, marrying uh, Hazrat uh, Umar. Uh, some uh, schools of thought uh, basically say that it's narrated in Bihari that this marriage took place. Um, that's my first question. And uh, the second question is, if the Sayyid can please explain the peace treaty between Imam Hassan and uh, 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 Mavia. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank brother. You. Thank you very much. Um, dealing with the first, as brother mentioned, misconception, which is that uh, Um Kulthum, uh, or a historical figure called Um Kulthum, who other schools say uh, possibly was the daughter of Imam Ali, uh, married uh, the second Khalifa of Islam. And if you'd like to clarify around that issue. Yeah, there seems to be um, a major dispute concerning this issue. That Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, had a number of daughters. He had Zainab al-Kubra, Zainab al-Sukhra, Um Kulthum al-Kubra, Um Kulthum al-Sukhra. And that some people come forward and state that is it true that Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, had come forward and married her? We reply by stating that our belief is that, the um, that Umar ibn al-Khattab did marry an Umm Kulthum, but not Umm Kulthum, daughter of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, but Umm Kulthum bin Jarwal al-Ansariya. Why? Because of the fact that if you go to books of history, you'll find that Umar's wife, Umm Kulthum, died in the 50th year after Hijrah. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's daughter, Umm Kulthum, died in the 61st year after Hijrah. So it must be a different Umm Kulthum. And that different Umm Kulthum is Umm Kulthum bin Jarwal al-Ansariya. And the books are there of history for you to examine that issue. In terms of the treaty between Imam Hassan salam and Muawiyah, some people come forward and say, look, Muawiyah, there is no problem with Muawiyah because of the fact that Imam al-Hassan salam signed a treaty with him. First, we reply back to them by saying, on the first level, Muawiyah fought the caliph of his time. There is a problem with him. Muawiyah killed Ammar bin Yasir. There is a problem with him. Muawiyah, then when you look at the treaty, look at the terms of the treaty that were broken. The treaty that was agreed was what? The treaty that was agreed was that Muawiyah would stop the cursing of Imam Ali on the pulpits. Mm. And that number two, Muawiyah would uh, protect the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Number three, he'd stop the killing of the Shia of Ali. Number four, he'd give back the blood money of the martyrs at the Battle of Jamal and the Battle of Safin. And number five, and very importantly, that after he dies, the leadership goes back to Imam Hassan or Imam al-Hussein. Each one of these is broken. And brothers, I ask you to go on history, you'll find it very clearly, brothers and sisters, how he broke each one of them. Mm. In terms of the cursing of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, it continued in Muawiyah's time, after Muawiyah's time, until Umar bin Abdul Aziz stopped the cursing on the pulpit. Every Friday, they used to curse Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam on the pulpits of the Umayyad mosques until Umar bin Abdul Aziz stopped this cursing. In terms of changing the sunnah of the Prophet, this was the Muawiyah, if I want to explain changing sunnah, one sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to pray, uh, when he used to pray the khutbah of Salat al-Jum'ah, the khutbah he'd do it standing, the only man to have begun the sunnah of sitting is Muawiyah, for example. Number three, in terms of the uh, killing of the Shia of Imam Ali alayhi salam, People like Hajr bin Adi al-Kindi, Amr bin Hamak al-Khuza'i, people like this were all killed by Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan and his henchmen. In terms of giving back the blood money to the martyrs of Jamal Sufyan, that never ever came back. And in terms of the caliphate after him, he gave it to his despotic son and arguably one of the most tyrannical as well as arrogant rulers in Islamic history, Yazid. Mm. And you mentioned uh, Muawiyah sitting, and that actually was the consequence of a, of a curse put on him by the Prophet, was it not? Well, you know, you can go into different reasons in Islamic history yeah, as to brilliant. his lifestyle, yeah, 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 and you know, he unfortunately was quite bloated in terms of his eating habits. He would always be eating to a level where he just can't get full. Mm -hmm. And Imam al-Nasai, the author of one of the six books, was tortured because he narrated Related this hadith. hadith yeah, exactly. I believe we have another caller. As salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as salam wa barakatuh. My name is Naeem. I'm a river, and um, obviously, um, I've found out about Shiite, Sufi and Sunni, but um, I've heard a lot of people talk about that Shiite um, practices 
are innovations they have done. But obviously, I've not really spoken to him. It's the first time I've seen any share person to be able to speak to. So I would like to be able to, if you can clarify to me, why do people say that Shiite practices cannot be attributed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Do you have any other questions, brother? Um, basically, that's it. That's it. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a shame that revert brothers who come into the religion of Islam are straight away taught, you know, uh, uh, scandalous uh, statements such as this, that we are the ones who don't follow the sunnah of the Prophet and we innovate um, and we have bid'ah. On the contrary, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu has a piece of advice to you, brother, is the one who said, I leave behind for you the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt, the Quran and my family. Hold on to them. You'll never go astray. You'll meet me at the pool of Kothar. You'll find here that when we look at this, what we take as our teachings are from the Quran and from the Prophet through his family, through his daughter Fatima al Zahra, through Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, and his sons, Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. On the contrary, if you want to see innovations in Islam, you yourself can go and ask those who told you that the Shia, the people of Bid'ah, say to them, if the Shia, the people of Bid'ah, then can you please explain to me who are the ones who formulated a good Bid'ah and a bad Bid'ah? Mm. That in Islamic history, we have certain personalities who say, this is a good Bid'ah. Taraweeh was not in the time of Rasulullah in the idea of it being in Jama'ah, but I say it's a good Bid'ah that it should be in Jama'ah, for example. You find, for example, Hayya ala khayr al-amal was part of the Adhan. It's a good bid'ah to remove it, for example. Um, so when you're asking who are the people of the bid'ah, the people of the bid'ah are those who had a caliph who himself mm -hmm. began to talk about this good bid'ah, bad bid'ah, good bid'ah, bad bid'ah. Mm -hmm. The point is, who are you as a caliph to tell me what's a good innovation, what's a bad innovation? Mm -hmm. I follow the sunnah of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. What Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, did I do as mm -hmm. obligatory actions? As obligatory actions, I take from the Prophet. Someone who comes later on and says to me, he did this, but I believe I should do something else. That's a bid'ah. Mm. And unfortunately, there are many acts which the Prophet was allowing in his time, which people after he passed away started changing. Absolutely. And that is definitely not the actions of the Shia. Um, which will lead me on to my next question. Thank you very much, by the way, for that call, brother. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, as you mentioned, after the passing of the Prophet, certain uh, so we say fatwas were passed, certain rules were made, which violated the practices of the Prophet wasallam. And one of them was the practice of, and this is something which is always thrown as an accusation against the Shia, the practice of the limited marriage, the timed marriage. And um, People always say, you Shias, you do uh, haram acts, you do something which was a bid'ah, and that this which is called in Arabic mut'ah, is a is a bid'ah and is zina actually astaghfirullah how would you answer that uh, accusation we believe like all muslims believe that the temporary marriage known as mut'a was practiced in the time of the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi to this there is no doubt go to any school of jurisprudence say to them in the time of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, was there an act called the temporary marriage where a person agrees a dowry with a prospective partner and a time period in which they are to be together, the reply would be, yes, there was. You ask them then, who banned it? Mm. Did the Prophet himself ban it? No, the Prophet didn't ban it. Nor did Abu Bakr ban it. It was Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he's the one who came forward and said that this was practiced as well as Hajj al tamattu They were practiced in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But I am the one who has now banned them and prohibit them and punish anyone who is seen to perform them. Mm. Hold on a minute, who's the prophet? Mm. I said, what was the point of me for 23 years believing that this man receives revelation and then after this man has left the earth, people start coming forward and saying what's good and what's bad and what's law and what's not. Someone replies to me by saying, no, in Bukhari there is a hadith which says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on the day of Khaybar, he banned the eating of donkey meat and he banned uh, mut'a. I reply by saying that the verse in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, فَمَسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ هُنَّ فَأَتُوهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ فَرِيضَةً Those who you take in marriage, you give their dowries as for that appropriate time. We replied to them by saying this verse, if you're saying that Mut'a was banned at Khaybar, but this verse came down in Hunayn, and Hunayn is after Khaybar. Mm. If the verse came down at Hunayn, and you're saying it got prohibited at Khaybar, how can you prohibit something that hasn't come yet? Mm. It was prohibited by whom? It was prohibited by the second caliph, 
not by Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And I raise this question, why would Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi allow the temporary marriage for his companions? Because they said, Ya Rasulullah, we have reached a level where we're going to perform an act sexually which is wrong. Can you offer us an option? Why would the Prophet offer his companions an option? But we, his, his followers, aren't given any option whatsoever. Why? So what, the companions, what, what's so special that they are allowed an option for their desires? Are they different human beings? No, they're the same human beings. They have the same desires. But Rasulullah offered an option. That's why even within the Shia today, you'll find certain people who come forward and say, I don't believe in none of this, it's not right. Listen, don't say I don't believe. Don't disrespect Rasulullah mm. Say I'm trying to understand the wisdom of. Because mm. you get these Tom, Dick and Harrys out there who think they've all become... Um, knowledgeable scholars and they'll come around to you and they'll say to you I don't believe in this you know that it doesn't no say I'm trying to understand the mm. wisdom behind it mm. the Quran is the word of God the Prophet is a form of guidance for us as mankind he allowed it because of desires but there is a point to be made here the point is you don't abuse any act there are some people who say I don't like what I because people abuse it mm, Habibi people abuse Salah mm. people abuse fasting yeah. People abuse, for example, uh, the act of paying zakat and khums. Mm. How many people do you see who abuse it? Mm. You see people praying salah, 30 seconds he's finished the salah. So do we stop praying salah mm. or do we educate the people? Likewise, on the issue of the temporary marriage, it's very important to understand. If you see people abusing them, go and advise them. Mm. The uh, counter argument again, though, is that, see people, and I've heard this argument, why didn't Imam Ali reverse the banning of muta? Imam Ali salam, and with a number of actions of people who had banned predecessors to him, when he'd come forward and he'd say something, you'd have the party of that person would come forward and say, we stick to the sunnah of Omar, the mm. sunnah of Omar. Mm. At the end of the day, you could follow the sunnah of Rasulullah, the sunnah of Omar is up to you. Mm. And there's the hadith that Imam Ali Even it happened with Sarawi. Mm. Yeah. If it wasn't for the banning of uh, Muta Ali. If it wasn't it, for the banning of Muta, there wouldn't be anyone committing yeah. adultery except the worst of people. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, now, moving on to that, and I think maybe another accusation, and you know, just to remind viewers, the last caller was actually a revert to Islam, and who said, you know, people have told him that you know Shias do bid'ah as well, and I'm sure possibly the brothers heard the accusation that Shias they be they beat themselves, and um, you know they try to sort of uh, mock the Shia passion and emotion and love for Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. How do you answer this question? You know, why do Shias do these uh, certain acts? First and foremost, I don't like it when people generalize that over any school in Islam. Mm. And that even affects us as followers of Ahlul Bayt, sometimes against other schools in Islam. Don't come and generalize and say, all the Shia in the world beat themselves. No, I personally have gone to lecture in certain parts of Africa where there are people who don't do it because they say it's not part of our culture, for example. Mm. So number one. Number two, what's the uh, reasoning behind this act? Number one, this act is not obligatory. If you don't perform the act, it doesn't mean you leave Islam. And if you do perform the act, it doesn't mean you're religious. Mm. The act is a cultural expression of love towards the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You find people who beat their chests because the chest of Imam al Hussein mm. alayhi salam, the grandson of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, his chest had horses trample upon it. So the Shia today, when they beat their chest, they remember that holy chest. Mm which used to be kissed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they remember it. Mm. Someone says, but you can't express your grief in this way. The Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam cried until he became blind. Don't give me this idea that you can't express, express grief. Otherwise, he's a prophet of God. I've never seen a human cry until they become blind. Allah doesn't condemn him for it. Mm. Or Sarah, the mother of Isma, uh, uh, Ishaq and the wife of Ibrahim slaps herself, the Quran says, uh, viciously when she hears what? Uh, when she hears uh, of the birth of her son you know when she smacks herself in that story but what we say is any extreme expression of grief is not allowed in Islam it's better to stay on that which is moderate if a person cries that's a moderate expression of grief you beat your chest it's a moderate expression of grief areas where you're going to extremes you know you're going to harm yourself that you should remain away from but the basis of it is what? The basis is that we are honoring what happened to the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. I tell you, there are people, all they do all day long is saying, the Shia beat the chest, the Shia beat the chest. Ask him, say to him, you know Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, tell me something about his life. Mm. 
He'll say, sorry, say, tell me something. You know, you, you've got a problem with the Shia, don't you? About their love for Imam al-Hussein You on the 10th of Muharram, instead of remembering Imam al-Hussein, go out fasting and have weddings and celebrate. Have respect for yourself. Instead of looking at other schools' behavior with the family of the Prophet, at least that other school is trying to remember that man. On a follow-up question which you had asked, which was, so do the Shia beat themselves because they feel guilty that they killed Imam al Hussein? Yeah, yeah. This is a ridiculous statement which always people try and state that Imam al Hussein was killed by the Shia. The people of Kufa let him down and they were Shia. We go back to the beginning of the show. What do we state? In the beginning of the show, we said that the word Shia means the party of or the followers of. In Kufa, when Imam al Hussein was going to rise against Yazid, Imam al Hussein, the people of Kufa had promised him that they join him. There were two types of Shia in Kufa. There was a Shi'i who believed Imam al Hussein is an Imam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is a successor of the Prophet in protecting the Quran. In terms of the Prophet was the final Prophet, and the Imam is the protector of the interpretation of the Quran. An Imam who is infallible. That's a Shi'i. Then there's a second type of Shi'i who's like, yeah, well, if Hussein's fighting Yazid, we're with him. And if Abdullah bin Umar fights Yazid, we're with him. And if Marwan bin Al-Hakim and whoever fights Yazid, we're with them. It depends. Whoever's fighting Yazid, we'll join him. We are their Shia. Those first groups of Shia who believed in him as someone who is infallible, who believed in him as someone who is chosen through designation as a successor of the Prophet, those Shia were either executed like Muslim ibn Aqil and Hani bin Arwa and Abbas al-Jadali, or they were imprisoned like Mukhtar al thaqafi like Maytham al tammar like Kumail al hamadani or they went to Karbala, like Habib ibn Madahir or Muslim ibn Awsajah. So for someone to come and say it was the Shia who killed Imam al-Hussein, the Shia of Kufa, and the Shia of Kufa let him down, I say first and foremost, know what Shia means. Mm. Secondly, the Shia of Kufa let him down. Is that your argument? How many nice Medi Medinian companions let down Rasulullah when he'd go towards a battle like Tabuk? The Quran says their feet are heavy on the ground they don't go and join him why it's hot why my parents don't allow me why i might die look don't generalize on a group of people you go and you study history properly and furthermore the argument that the shias let them down so the the answer that must follow then is well okay this group of people let them down where were the thousands of thousands of other muslims in if the other this cities? group of people let if them down if this group of people, people let, let them, them down, down. Where so the where's abdullah bin umar where's abdul rahman bin abu bakr mm. Surely they should where's defended. people like uh, you know those other come abdullah bin zubair mm. all companions sons of zubair sons of umar sons of abu bakr where were they to help imam hussein alayhi salam so when a person says it's the shia who killed them, okay where were those companions who saw the grandson of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi martyred exactly um, I think inshallah now uh, we're going to go to another break and again you are with Isa Ali and if you'd like to call us there is 0208-900-1741 and the number should be across the bottom of your screens for the c remainder of the show. Uh, as we enter this last segment we're going to carry on discussing the various misconceptions surrounding Shiism and Shia Islam and the uh, school of the Ahlul Bayt salam. and I believe uh, to start straight off we have another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, sis. Um, I came across uh, one of the sermons by Imam Ali alayhi salam a few days ago, and he says, um, with regard to me, two categories of people will be ruined, namely he who loves me too much and the love take the love takes him away from rightfulness, and he who hates me too much and the hatred takes him away from rightfulness. Um, the best man with regard to me is he who is on the middle course. So be with the greatest majority of Muslims because Allah, Allah's hand of protection is on keeping unity. You should be, you should be aware of division because one isolated from the group is a prey to Satan just as one isolated from the flock of sheep is a prey to the wolf. Um, so a lot of Muslims from other schools of Islam use this as an argument and like say that Shias fit into the description. So I just wanted you to clarify what Imam Ali means by this. Thank you very much, sister. Excellent call. Uh, you yes, you can easily reply to them by putting it in the context of Nahrawan. You see, what they're trying to do is trying to say that Imam Ali salam says that there are people who will love me too much and there are people who hate me too much and that both are the losers and that you should follow the majority who are the middle. Mm. So what certain people try and say is, look, Imam Ali himself is saying that the majority of the people are right. Follow them about me. Not those who went too far in their love or too far in their hatred. And so they say, look, we're the majority right now, more than you are. 
So that means we have the right idea by Imam Ali. If you want to look at the context, as it being a battle like Nahrawan, for example, or a battle like Safin, for example, you want to look at the context, then there are people who loved Ali ibn Abi Talib too much. They ended up fighting him at Nahrawan. There are those who hated him. They were in the same army fighting. But you had the majority of people in battles with Imam Ali, those battles which are the context, who were the people you should stay with, for they are the ones who are on the righteous path. So you can't take that sermon of Nahj al completely out of context and say, look today, who's the majority Muslims? No, look at the time when the wars are taking place and who are the majority group, which is the middle way, which is the supporters of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib And the description of those who love the Imam too much, alayhi salam, alayhi salam, is uh, obviously, as you said, thrown at us. But isn't it more accurate to say that those, like we mentioned before, like Abdullah ibn Sabah, who uh, uh, put divinity on Imam Ali? Well, yes, that people those who, who love yeah. him too much that raise him as a god. Yeah, if you say uh, people who love Imam Ali alayhi salam too much, that's those who raise him to God. So the Hulat extremists in different parts of Islamic history who said Imam Ali was God, mm. those people love him too much. Then those who hate him are those who fought him at Jamal and Safin and Nahrawan. Those are the ones who have hatred for him. Mm. And it's ironic that if people try and level this to say that follow the majority of the Muslims, unfortunately, if it's the majority of Muslims today, they love those who fought Ali ibn Abi Talib and they love Ali ibn Abi Talib, which is a complete contradiction. Absolutely. Um, another point which is related to this, and it's that um, the, uh, another accusation against the Shia is that the Shias hate all of the Sahaba and that they abuse and use foul language against the Sahaba. And this again ties into how we started the show, which was dealing with the akhlaq of certain people who are not, uh, who are claiming to represent the school of Ahlul Bayt and aren't doing it in any way with their akhlaq. How do you answer the accusation regarding the Shia, the correct Shia position towards the, uh, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Well, the correct Shia position towards the companions of the Prophet is the position of the Qur'an and the position of the Sunnah. The Qur'an divides the companions of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi into a group who are uh, firm against the disbelievers and they are merciful between themselves. You find them in Ruku and in Sujood constantly receiving the glory of their Lord. So that's one group of companions. Then there's another group of companions, for example, they are the ones who Allah revealed the verse called Al-Munafiqoon about. Although in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he looks at them and is pleased with their bodies and listens to their words. But they are like that timber which is so soft that these people who are around you, they take their um, belief as just an excuse. They are liars, they are hypocrites, but they are seen as Sahaba because they surround him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to reveal a surah called the hypocrites. So the Quran itself is saying, that amongst the Sahaba, there are those righteous ones who are merciful amongst themselves. And there are those who surround you and say that we believe you are the Prophet of God, but they are liars. So even the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi will come to the pool of Kothar. He sees his Sahaba going one way. He asked Jibreel, why are they going that way? He said, you don't know what they did after you. A Sahaba in Shia terminology or Sahabi is not someone who... Uh, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is a good man. Then after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi angers his daughter and angers his son-in-law and fights his family, is a good man with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the family until they pass away. Someone whose principles remain the same, not they change after the mm. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has passed away. Mm. So we come forward and say the Quran provides us with a barometer. Mm. There are some people who are praised and there are some people who are even amongst his companions who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks down upon. Those who in Salat al Jum'ah, they left the Prophet standing alone in his salah. You can't praise them. They're Sahaba, but they, ran, they left Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in his Jum'ah. Uh, jum Those who ran away from the Battle of Uhud, they are Sahaba, but they ran away from Rasulullah in the Battle of Those who made excuses for the Battle of Tabuk, they are Sahaba, but they didn't turn up to the Battle of Tabuk with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So our point is, you look at every person individually, you study their lives, their merits. You see, did Rasulullah say, this person is my Sahabi? Did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi say, this person is my sahabi and will never leave our way and will be loyal to us? We take him and we respect him. Uh, we have another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Questions. I'll be very quick. Sure. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask is regarding um, Major Blaga. Uh, obviously, it's not included into our four major books of this. Uh, why is that so? That's the first question. The second question I'd like to ask is regarding um, immediate uh, brothers of the Imams of Islam or children of the Imams uh, of Islam who uh, came forward and apparently claimed um, imamate. Um, is this correct? Because obviously we've got, for example, Hadad Zed. Is it true that he ever claimed to be an imam and he rebelled? 
uh, just the second question. The third question I'd like to ask is regarding um, the Shia Imamiya school. Uh, how many years after um, Imam Zamana was it formulated? Because some people say that the whole Imamiya school, you know, it, it, it never existed even during the times of the Holy Prophet, let alone during the time of the 12th Imam al Islam. So perhaps you can shed some light on this. And the final question I'd like to ask is totally random, is regarding the names of Imam Ali al Islam's sons. Some people say um, that he named his children after the Khalifs. Now, what I'd like to know is if this is the case, how many of the Khalifs named their children after the, the Holy Infallibles? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, with regards to the, uh, uh, the question regarding, I believe it was, the formulation of Imam, I'm not sure we're going to get time to do that today, although I do want to discuss um, the concept of Imam Mahdi uh, in a moment. And the um, other answers were um, the concept of Nashru Balagha was, is it, why is it not one of the Hadith books? It's not one of the Hadith books because it's not focused on Hadith, it's, uh, it's focused on Arabic literature and language and the greatness of the prose and poetry of Imam Ali salam in some of his sermons. So it's not a book which was primarily for hadiths, but a book for greatness of Arabic literature and for the people who enjoyed the reading of Arabic literature. And the uh, the brother's question, I just want to go through these questions very quickly. Um, the concept of any brothers, we discussed this last week in our show about Imam Radha, uh, which brothers of any of the Imams, such as Zayd, did he actually claim it for himself or was it conferred upon him? In, in the Shia Imami school, we don't believe Zayd claimed Imam it for himself, but was rather a rightful follower of Imam al Baqir. There his may story. have been later brothers of Imams who may have tried to lead Salah and claim they are leaders rather than Imams, mm. um, especially later on near the time of Imam al Hadi or Imam al Askari. But there is no other evidence of such a case happening. And the uh, question regarding, um, you know, uh, the names of these sons. They have uh, sons. Imam has a son, for example, by the name of Uthman. Imam Ali alayhi salam has a son by the name of Uthman, who was named after Uthman ibn Mad'un, mm -hmm. the 14th convert to Islam. Um, we might as well touch on that point which the brother mentioned, which is um, regarding the formulation of a school of uh, the, as he mentioned, Imamiyah school, mm. school of Ahl al-Bayt, and uh, did it happen after the time of uh, Imam Mahdi? I actually don't want to touch on the concept of Imam Mahdi himself. One, another accusation which is thrown is that Imam al-Hasan salam Imam al-Hasan al-Askari salam never had a son, and that uh, he had a son or he passed away or he'd never had a son, and that this is something the Shias later made up, the scholars of the Shias made up, and they created the concept of an Imam in uh, occultation to kind of fill this space so to speak there's already a belief and you can even see it if you don't want to see it in the world of hadith you can see it in the world of poetry for example in Imam Sadiq alayhi salam's time he's already discussing this idea of Imam al-Mahdi being born to Imam al-Askari alayhi salam he's already discussing this idea when he's discussing it with Sayyid al-Hamyari when Sayyid al-Hamyari is reciting poetic verses about this issue Likewise, Imam Ali ibn Musa radha alayhi salam, Ja'bal bin Ali al-Khuza'i recites poetry about Imam al-Mahdi who's to be born. It means it was a firm theological belief in the time of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and the time of Imam al-Radha alayhi salam. And even Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim within their books of hadith already mentioned this idea of a Mahdi being born from that particular lineage. Um, even if you were to look at Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, for example, al-Usul al arbamia the 400 usul of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, you find in those 400 usul there are, there's even a manuscript in Tahran until today which mentions the names of each of these Imams. And the fact that there was so much house um, security and presence of soldiers outside the house of Najis highlights they knew that a son was to be born imminently. Uh, we have another call on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Salam, brother. Salam, brother. Um, I want to ask about Imam Hassan and Islam, but before I do, I just want to respond to um, a previous caller who was saying, why did Hazrat Ali al-Islam not protect the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Imam Ali al-Islam did not protect himself. Um, he knew what Ibn, Ibn Mujim was about to do, but he did not actually, he in fact woke him up and he did not interrupt him, let him do what he had to do, and Hazrat Ali carried on with his prayer. Um, but my questions are regarding Imam Hassan and Mushtaba al-Islam. There is a common belief in the Ummah that the Shias do not regard Imam Hassan and Mushtaba al-Islam as the same status as Imam Hussein. Um, secondly, that his children, of, the children of Imam Hassan al-Islam, are not Sayyid. And thirdly, um, that Imam Hassan and Mushtaba al-Islam, God forbid, he married frequently. Um, if the Sayyid could tackle those and also offer any advice he could to the media channels on how to promote Imam Hassan and Mustafa al-Islam status amongst the Shia. 
Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the brothers call dealing with the uh, third Imam, Imam Al Hassan Al Mujtaba, alayhi salam. And the first issue was are the, or there's an accusation that the sons of Imam Al Hassan aren't Sayyids? No, you have even people who were later called Sharifs who are taken to be from the lineage of Imam Al Hassan, alayhi salam. Of course, there are differences of opinion as to whether this is unanimous in the idea that when you hear someone who's given the title of Sharif, does that mean he has to be a Hassani? That there's a difference of opinion on. But there are definitely Hassanid Sayyids and some great ulama were born from the Hassanid line. In terms of Imam al-Hassan not being revered as high as Imam al-Hussain, Imam al-Hassan without a shadow of doubt is the second of the greatest Imams of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and was an Imam who Imam al-Hussain would constantly look up to. And we find that the Prophet used to say that in his nobility, his character, he was resembling me. If you resemble Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, mostly in your nobility and your character, then there is no doubt the reference that is to be given to such a personality. If someone says we don't revere Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, the fact that we do his wilada, when we do his wilada in Shahar Ramadan and his shahada in Safar, highlights just how much we revere this great colossal figure of the family of the Prophet. And very quickly, the uh, issue of his marriages. Issue of the marriages is a concoction of Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi. Um, Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, in his problems that he had with the Hassanid line, uh, because he had fought some of the Hassanid line, Muhammad Nafs al zakiya later Yahya bin Abdullah bin al-Hassan would fight Harun al-Rashid. So he begins to form myths and concocts allegations about Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam so that that Hassanid line reputation is destroyed. And when you look at the type of people who narrate that Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam was a habitual divorcer, people like Abu Talib al makki in Quwwat al qulub he narrates such things. You go and read their reputations. Their reputations are the worst of reputations. Mm. So you find that the books of history which try and blaspheme Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam were all Abbasid propaganda against Hassanid um, uprisings. Thank you very much. We have another caller. As Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum, uh, brother. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Right. Uh, I got, uh, actually, I got three questions, if I may. Um, you can ask them, but I'm not sure if we can answer all of them because of time constraints, but please ask. Right. Uh, I, I, I'll be very quick. Uh, sure. My first one is about the, uh, about the uh, Imam and Nabi and Rasul. It, it is it is in in Shia book uh, that says that the uh, Imam uh, hears the voice of the uh, f uh, angels. Uh, the Nabi hears the voice of angels and he dreams, and the Ras Rasul hears the voice of the angel. Uh, angel he dreams and he sees the angels. This is written in a Shia book. Yeah. So they are, is, is it not that they are making something that Imam has the, has the, self, uh, the same level as the Nabi? And I, I, I was watching your TV, and you, you, uh, your uh, scholar was saying that uh, Ibrahim a.s. was Nabi, then he became Rasul, then he became Khalil, and then after okay. ceremony, First, he became Imam. We raised you to an Imam. Yes. This is okay. one. The second one is about the marriage of Um Kulsum to uh, Azrat Umar. It was half. It is written in Shia book. It was half from uh, someone asked Imam Jafar al Sadiq radiallahu anhu about the uh, about the uh, idda when the when the husband dies. Uh, about the wife, can she uh, perform her, her idda in somewhere else? And Imam Jafar Sadiq uh, said, uh, give the example of uh, the daughter of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, that yes, when Umar uh, radiallahu anhu died, Ali ibn Abi Talib went and he bring Hum Kulsum, his daughter, to, to his house for Idda. This is the second. The third one is, uh, oh, I forgot. Um, sorry, brother, our time is running very low because we are coming to the end of the show, uh, but we're gonna try and answer at least one of those questions. I'm very sorry. But thank you very much for your call. And so he's, the brother's gone. Uh, the first question was, um, in fact, an interesting question. The raising 
uh, as we shias put it, of uh, or it's, uh, the Quran mentions of uh, Nabi Ibrahim to the status of Imam. Well, I'll answer both questions for the brother. In terms of the first question, he said that a Rasul, for example, sees and hears, and a Nabi hears or sees and dreams the angels, and an Imam uh, can hear the angel talk. So the, the brother clearly has a problem with how can an Imam hear an angel talk. The reference I'll give him is that Bibi Maryam, السلام, who's neither a prophet nor an Imam, used to converse with Jibra'il, alayhi salam. And if uh, Maryam, who's not an Imam or a Prophet, Allah grants her the honor that the angels can come and speak to her, then why would the angels who are ordered to bless Muhammad and Al-Muhammad not be able to come and speak to the family of the Prophet? In terms of Ibrahim, the verse is clear. In nasi imama. Ibrahim was a Nabi, then a Rasul, then a Khalil, then an Imam. Meaning at the beginning of his um, uh, life, he was ordered to protect a Sharia. Then he bought a Sharia then his role was to govern by the Sharia. And that governorship of the Sharia was the highest level he had reached because sometimes you may bring a Sharia but not be able to govern it in your own lifetime. But to reach a level where you can govern with your Sharia as well is the highest level that you can reach. And the way um, in the Quran is actually raised. Yeah, yeah, he's raised, yeah. In yeah. Lil Nasi Imama. Even if the person says, well, how could Ibrahim, what, so what's so special about Imam? It's Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajallallah Farja Al-Sharif, even Al-Mahdi in Sunni works, he will lead prayers with a Nabi like Isa behind him. Mm. Um, in terms of the second issue where the brother says within Shia books, there is this reference. In the same uh, works, you see, first and foremost, you don't just take a hadith and say it says this. Ask yourself the question, has a hadith been put in the one after this hadith, which says this chain is strong, whereas the previous one is not? You find that the hadith which he quotes, he doesn't seem to quote the one after, where Imam al-Sadiq has asked the question, is this true? He says, woe be to you that we would give our daughter and so on. I don't need to go into depth, but he says we would not give our daughter towards uh, such personalities. So the question is, who is this Umm Kulthum married to? This Umm Kulthum, uh, daughter of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, was married to uh, Aoun, the son of um, Ja'far. Mm. As we know, Imam Ali has a hadith, he says, my daughters are for my brother's sons. Mm. Bibi saying that married Abdullah bin Ja'far, um, and you find that Umm Kulthum is known to have married Aun, the son of Ja'far. So this whole idea of marrying uh, Umar, that Umm Kulthum, who Umar married, was Umm Kulthum bin Jarwal al ansariya Excellent, thank you. Um, we still have a few more issues to work through. We are coming towards the end of the show. Um, we've clarified, I believe, the concept, uh, the belief that Astaghfirullah uh, Shia's worship Imam Ali as being false. Um, so I'm going to Astaghfirullah, I'm going to focus on the uh, concept of taqiyya. Uh, and to finalize the show, a lot of people will say, oh, you Shias, you are allowed to lie in your religion, Astaghfirullah. Could you accept, uh, sorry, explain the concept of taqiyya for the viewers and how this misconception is obviously a slanderous one? Yes, this issue of taqiyya seems to be the most famous one. That it even defeats the issue of muta and defeats the issue of, uh, you know, worshipping Ali and all those other myths that are created. And it's ironic, sometimes someone says to you, those are the Shia who do taqiyya. So let's just help him and say to him that in Arabic it's taqiyya first. When we look at this issue of taqiyya, what do we state? We state that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of nations who had dissimulated their beliefs, in order to protect the religion or protect their life. For example, Ashab al-Kahf had dissimulated their belief. Um, they had hidden their beliefs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises this for them. You find in, surah, in the story of Musa alayhi salam, there was a rajul mu'minun min al Fir'aun yaktumu imana. He conceals his belief. He was from the people of Fir'aun, but he had to conceal his belief because it's a matter of life and death. In Surah 3, verse 28 of the Quran, لا يتخذ المؤمنون الكافرين أولياء من دون المؤمنين ومن يفعل ذلك فليس من الله من شيء إلا أن تتقوا منهم تقات. The verse very clearly states that the believers should not take the disbelievers as their guardians, um, and whoever does will not have Allah as his guardian unless he's concealing his belief. In other words, there were times in the mission of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله where you would conceal your belief in a matter of life or death. The Shia also reach a position where they conclude theologically that if it's a situation where you are in a matter of life or death, then you are allowed to conceal your belief as Ammar ibn Yasir mm. concealed his belief in Surah 16 verse 106 with the verse stating, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, illa man ukriha wa qalbuh mutma'innun bil-Iman, except the one who is compelled but his heart, his belief 
in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ammar ibn Yasir was so tortured by Abu Jahl and by those who surrounded him that Abu Jahl kept saying to him, leave the religion of God, leave the religion of God. He said that, okay, I leave it and I become an idol worshiper because of how much he was being tortured. Allah revealed the verse when Ammar went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saying, Ya Rasulullah, I only said that because I was being tortured. Otherwise, you know I believe in God. The verse revealed, we know that your heart believed in God, but you were compelled to do such an act. So if someone comes and says, Taqiyya, where is it in the Quran? Surah 3 verse 28, Surah 40 verse 28, Surah 16 verse 106. These are all ample proofs of Taqiyya within the Holy Quran. And um, also, I believe we still have time for one more issue. It's the issue of uh, Ali and Wali Allah in the Adhan and also in the, sh in the testimony of faith. Yes, there are people out there who say that um, if you listen to the Adhan of the Shia, mm. you'll find that in their Adhan they will say, Ashhadu anna Ali and Wali Allah. Ashhadu anna Ali and Wali Allah is not part of the Adhan of the Shia. Ashhadu anna Ali and Wali Allah is to be said in the sense of a recommendation that whenever you bless Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he should also send your blessings on his family. And that Ali ibn Abi Talib is the highest member of that family of the Prophet after him. So anyone who comes and says that the Shia says part of the other, no, even Shia scholars come forward and state that if anyone who has, an, uh, has the intention that Ashhadu anna Ali and Wali Allah has an obligatory statement in the Adhan, his Adhan becomes null and void. So someone asked them, why do you stress on Ashhadu anna Ali and Wali Allah after Ashhadu anna Muhammad and Rasulullah? There was a period of time, for example, where we would send our blessings after Rasulullah's blessings have been sent. There was a period when Imam Ali was being cursed on the pulpits of the Umayyads and we replied back to that curse. But for anyone to come forward and state that we believe it's wajib in the Adhan, no, not at all. We believe it's part of the Adhan, no, not at all. We believe it's a recommended blessing after Rasulullah uh, has been um, his blessings sent on. Um, it's ironic because there are other schools in Islam who included things which Rasulullah didn't do. For example, as salatu khayrun min an -nawm. prayer is better than sleep, was not part of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was added by Umar ibn al-Khattab. So you find everyone has their own jurisprudential opinion. Which is the claim that uh, it's a bid'ah al-hasanat. It's a good bid'ah. Yeah. Um, also uh, in the shahada, I don't know if you'd want to answer that as well. The concept of testifying after tawheed, after nubu'ah, and also to the wilaya of uh, the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. Yes, there is a belief that um, the first of the shahada is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. The second is Ashhadu anna Muhammadun Rasulullah. Legally speaking, in jurisprudence, anyone who says these two, they are a Muslim and they're to be honored and their blood is sanctified and so on. It's all uh, within the books of jurisprudence. So someone says, but you add Ashhadu anna Ali wa Allah. Does that mean someone who doesn't say Ashhadu anna Ali wa Allah isn't to be honored? No. Anyone is a Muslim who says la ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. But Ashhadu anna Ali wa is just a belief which we come forward with where we state that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the wilaya or the guardianship he received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had extended to Imam Ali alayhi salam in his lifetime that at the end of his life he announced it and that after he passed away Imam Ali alayhi salam and his sons become the guardians of Allah's message on earth. Um, thank you very much. Sayyid Amma, thank you very much for thank joining you. us again tonight. Um, again, I'm sure all of us have learned so much that we didn't know before and have managed to clarify a lot of the issues that have been raised against the followers of the Ahlul Bayt and against the Shia Muslims all around the world. Not even recently, throughout the beginning of history, as you mentioned some pertinent examples of people from the time of uh, the, you know, the uh, early Abbasid caliphates and even uh, before that. So thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, I'd like to thank you as well for joining us here on Ahli Bayt TV on the 20th hour. And uh, as you know, this is a show every Saturday from 8 till 10 p.m. with Sayyid Amman Ikhwani. And also, I believe we now have an email address uh, if you'd like to contact us and send any questions or other comments which you have. It's 20th.hour at ahlibayt.tv and I believe it's at the bottom of your screen right there. And so if you have any feedback, you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, inshallah, you can forward us your comments. And also, I'd like to remind viewers again, this is a weekly show and it's a live phone and call. So if you ever have any uh, topics, uh, any questions, please try to keep them as close as possible to the topic of the show. So from myself, Isa Ali, and from Sayyid Amman uh, we we just have to bid you good night and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين